Yeah, thank you, Vincenzo. Thank you so much for having me here at API Days. It's a great honor to be here, and I'm really glad to be able to talk to you about the topic which is surprisingly my favorite, the topic of GDPR. Um, my name is Karen Sorry, so you pronounce it all right. Uh, I've been a technical writer for all, more than six years now, and for more than three years of these six, I've been a technical writer in cryptography, in crypto, which I want to remind you, it's not cryptocurrency, but uh, crypto equations and cryptography and encryption. So, uh, before you run away from me and um, decide that it's a security talk, I'll tell you that it's part a security talk and part documentation talk. And since I want to tell you what is GDPR and how it can aid you in writing better documentation, uh, more precise documentation, documentation that can be and uh, can provide better help to your users, uh, let's define what is GDPR. So, uh, contrary to a popular Twitter belief, it's nowhere near the goddamn privacy regulation. It's general data protection regulation, and it applies to all citizens of the European Union, and it protects their privacy and their data. Uh, in uh, Great Britain, there is a counterpart to GDPR, which is called the DPI, Data Protection Bill, which was actually adopted about a year before GDPR, and which is uh, rather similar to GDPR. Also, uh, legislation that wants to protect you and your data and your privacy from all the bad things out there on the Internet. Uh, in uh, the USA, the counterpart to GDPR is the CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act, which is um, basically GDPR targeted at what you share when you buy something, to put it really in a crude way. So, but how is really GDPR necessary and why? And why did uh, governments on such a grand scale had to come up with something that would be able to protect you and your data and my data and everybody else's data from uh, people who would want to misuse it? Well, the joke that governments simply didn't want to have competition on that one, you know? Have you ever had some of your documents lost or maybe misplaced somewhere uh, while you have I've been applying to something. Um, but actually, there are easier examples. Let's think about Equifax, maybe Dropbox, Yahoo, LinkedIn, and of course, Cambridge Analytica scandal with Facebook. All those were not just breaches, but breaches and uh, leaks of, cons of uh, personal data on a grand scale. And to prevent that, something on a grander scale was necessary. You know, what is the problem with um, providing security measures on a large scale or even on any kind of scale? The problem is that security has negative value, which means that uh, when you implement something that's good and useful, it's good and useful straight away. You can show your progress, you can um, demonstrate what uh, the thing you have implemented does and how it actually aids your business, maybe it aids your users and consumers. But with security, uh, the best you can do is probably just a shrug from a manager who says, well, there have been no leaks so far and we are trying managing. By the way, my presentation is going to have a lot of funny pictures, so I'd appreciate uh, if something catches your fancy, share it on, on Twitter. There is my handle in the upper left corner. So, uh, well, returning to the notion of managers and security, when you try to suggest something security-wise, it's all what you get. No one wants to spend extra on security until there is data breach. But as I said, I've been working uh, for more than three years in security, and I think that better security and privacy and encryption is a good thing. Well, at least better security than nothing is a good thing already. So when GDPR was announced, uh, we actually we have been celebrating. Yeah, we cryptographers are just weird like that. But you know what the problem is? Uh, before I tell you what the problem is, I'll ask you um, to think about this. Uh, any ideas what this beautiful device, actually two models of this beautiful device are? Just take a look at this awesome thing. I will not 
to onto further it's uh, Nokia Communicator 9000 made in 1996. What's so special about it? It's the hottest smartphone of 1996. And here is the first iPhone introduced in 2007. And the problem is that the legislation that regulated data, mobile data, internet, internet privacy, consumer data privacy that was in use before GDPR, in, which came into full force in May 2018. So that legislation was uh, adopted in 1995. So it's legislation that was adopted before the smartphone, Nokia Communicator 9000, before the first iPhone. So you understand it was not the wild, wild west we have been living in. It was basically um, some prehistoric period and prehistoric legislation that had to regulate our data and the and communication and that was only advancing into the future. So here is the timeline on the grander scale of things. And it actually honestly scares me, to be honest with you. Which brings us to GDPR. A useful thing, now you know that it's a useful thing because uh, it was implemented to, you know, somehow deal and regulate the data that was out there after 1995, all the data. And what uh, is a good product without good documentation, right? So we're going to see how GDPR aids your API or conceptual documentation and how GDPR um, aids you uh, in providing better service to your users. GDPR targets obscurity. One of the main and central points in GDPR is that it demands explicit consent from users who have read or have seen and they actually understand what they are agreeing or disagreeing to when interacting with your content, in our case documentation or subscription forms. So when you see subscription forms like this, uh, JDPR demands uh, that you actually make your users understand what they are agreeing to. But before I elaborate on this, uh, let's, uh, let me tell you a short story. So, no, it's a story. So one beautiful morning in London, um, a few people waiting for the morning bus had a chance to connect to a free Wi-Fi spot, public spot. And they could have had a free browsing session, you know, free Wi-Fi. They only agreed and put a check mark that they agree to use this spot. And of course, no one read the documentation and no one read that um, agreement as they have been agreeing to the catch. Uh, this uh, Wi-Fi spot was actually um, installed there by a security company, which include a heared clause that promised free Wi-Fi in return for the um, newborn child of the people who connected to that Wi-Fi for the duration of the whole inter eternity. Of course, they never claimed the children, but um, this was a survey to demonstrate how badly we read the documentation, how badly we read the license agreements, and also the yes and then. But you know what? No one's got time for that. And even us, we do not always read the documentation or license agreements, right? This brings us to what I call the vicious circle of ignored documentation. First, the docs are hard to read, you know. We do not want to spend much time editing the docs or making them clearer because people don't read the docs anyway, right? That's what the developers often tell us. So why bother? So we deliver barely readable a highly complicated documentation, which will do. And as a result, no one reads the docs because they're hard to read, which leads us to the vicious circle. So JDPR brings us to tailoring documentation that's compliant with JDPR and with its explicit um, way of putting things into human language. So again, how this applies to our documentation? because our documentation is not only words that cover uh, our products. Our documentation is a way to communicate with humans who want to use our products. So if we do not speak human language, uh, it just, oh, everything is alien to our readers and people cannot, um, you know, people just cannot um, interact with our products at the best way they could. So the thing is we should strive for the 
simplest uh, ways to put our words and to, and to to provide people with simplest ways to describe what our product actually does. No one wants no one wants to read your complicated corporate lingo, right? No one wants to know your internal stuff. People just want to show up on your documentation page. They want to hook up to your API or they want to download your product and just run it with no problems. So if they uh, just see walls and walls of complicated text, uh, you will be breaking GDPR by design because uh, it, it's not explicit consent that you're getting from people. You're just confusing people and clicking yes to your documentation and to your subscription form, which is not what you should do. Instead of putting I agree, agree, agree or next buttons everywhere, we should explicitly tell people what they agree to like this. So I think you've been seeing more and more of such subscription forms that ask you um, to confirm that you explicitly agree to a certain thing like here. And here are some real world examples. I think this one I took at an airport somewhere where this approach was already adopted, I think, if you just a few months into GDPR, where every point that could have been a wall of text is already a clear statement, which allows the user, the reader, to say yes and no, while understanding exactly what they're agreeing to. But well, content is just the surface. And beyond the surface of documentation, what we impose on the readers, on our users, it's uh, an underground layer of documentation, uh, which is the information that users actually share with us to get to that documentation. I think everybody has been pretty sick of all those emails like, we have digital privacy policy, please uh, agree to receive the news updates from us, right? And we were laughing at it. And uh, everyone is always laughing at such um, websites that ask you to input credit card information and then of course it's stolen from you. But the thing is, why do we ask our users to do the same thing when we ask them for an email when we do not need them to share that email? When we ask the users to um, input some information we do not need. Actually, I've seen a question here on chat before I started my talk. Uh, somebody was asking, why was there a form uh, asking for the gender of a person uh, participating in this conference. So that's the example of some information that the user prefers not to share. Which brings us to the fact that GDPR classifies uh, documentation, uh, information and data into personal data and personal sensitive data. And personal data can include your name, email. So, you know, basically what I, I like to describe it as information that will, will not really get you into trouble. Probably the information that least likely to get you into trouble if it goes public. And there is also personal sensitive data, which includes race, ethnic origin, politics, you know, um, genetics. So I'd like to classify it for myself as information that if clicked, without your explicit consent can lead you into real trouble. So remember that when you ask users for any kind of information which you think you want from them, when you provide them with an access to your documentation or some other information, you know, freebies on your website, uh, some tutorials or maybe free materials that can be downloaded only after the users of your information portals, uh, leave their email, you may be leading them into danger without knowing that. Why? Because it's, you know, it's never just a password. Here's just another short question for you. Um, and I'll try to ask it myself, maybe on my expense. So have you ever just entered your email with some generic password on some website? just to get to some information quickly? Or have you ever reused the password? I'm sorry to say that even after three years in security, I, I'm guilty of doing that. Maybe not anymore, but I think before, knowing all that's going on under the hood, I was guilty of that, and most of us are. And the thing is, the problem is that with the help uh, of rainbow table attack, dictionary attacks, uh, the malicious attackers can just take the keys 
to your other information because you know some silly passwords that you entered 10 years ago on some silly website uh, could have been reused by you because it's just a really convenient password to use the one it's really convenient to remember on some more important website right where maybe uh, not as important as your banking information but there you in put in the name of your first pet and then the malicious attackers can just go and you know hack your bank information and get to your information step by step so you know that's great power and great responsibility now that you know that just by holding your um, subscribers emails when you don't need to you are probably you getting them into danger there is a really great TED talk by Dale Harvey uh, from Twitter uh, which um, um, tells you how a picture of your cat can get you into danger and even lead to your death. I highly recommend watching this TED talk uh, for, you know, home this topic in, that all the access information that leaks about you or about your user outside can lead to grave consequences. And which is why we need to remember that when asking for any kind of information from the people who want to read our content. So knowing this and knowing that any information leaking out can uh, lead our users to trouble, we just need to understand that all information is sensitive. And we need to keep our requirements towards our users really low and really simple. If you want to read the information, come on, read the information. If you want people to subscribe to read our information, we need to provide some value in return, and we need to explain what is going um, to be done with that information for people to be able to subscribe. Yes, you probably heard it all before, and you unsubscribe or subscribe to some subscription form online yourself, but it's still happening and we still ask for access to information and we do not encrypt it, which can lead to grave and dangerous consequences for your users. So keep things simple and don't over um, complicate the language you're using when you're addressing your um, users. If you collect more information um, uh, to provide the access to your API sandboxes or maybe to sandboxes to try your products online. Make sure that you uh, keep all the information separate. Make sure that you keep all the instances, all information and all the instances of your software separate. And if you implement this, uh, like security by design is one of the main uh, central points of GDPR. So if you implement this, show to, to users how you do implement this, because this is really important. And this makes and puts people at ease much more. For instance, uh, here in a piece of documentation I've created, um, I explicitly warned people about the grave consequences of doing something with a product. And here, um, Berlin Airport um, informed me about all the things I'm going to do with my information once I connect to the Wi-Fi. So see, GDPR is actually caring for us. And I have a really funny story about GDPR and care. You know, when GDPR was only taken, uh, coming into full power in May 2018. So one of my, no, actually most of my banks did not have the option to, you know, to unsubscribe from something or maybe to provide my consent to actually giving them some information I would not like to be sharing with them. But one of the rock bands that I really like, Fields of Nephilim, they were the first ones to put up the cookie policy wall on their website and, the GD and implement GDPR policy. So that's the example of caring for your users through GDPR. So now after this, let's sum it up, probably. So first of all, even GDPR implemented uh, to the best of your ability in your documentations and not uh, bulletproof. It's not, you know, a silver bullet in itself. It's just one of different tools to help you provide documentation that is useful and that is simple and that is actually like does not uh, lead your users into more danger than they should be in. 
And JDPR should be just treated as uh, just another style guide, you know, as technical writers, as writers. Uh, many of us, you know, Chicago manual of style, you know, so should press and Google developer manual of style, all of them. So treat JDPR as just like another manual of style that actually mm, brings something really useful to your readers. And well, now that you know, welcome to the security team because we are all part of security team in these times. As, as a further reading, I'd love to, to actually read the full text of GDPR if you haven't already. There is a full text of GDPR and there is um, not divided into any kind of uh, chapters and there is this um, a more useful text of GDPR. I think I will provide the links after I'm done with my talk into the chat because yeah, I forgot to remake this into clickable links. I wish you for credits. And well, thank you for having me. I think I'm ready to be answering the questions now. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we do have one question from Stephen Price again. And I think uh -huh. I've answered it, but let's go, let's go through that anyway. Like, do you have any reference we can research online for GDPR style guide that it's not the official documentation, which is probably too boring for everybody here in the audience? I will share in a few minutes um, in the chat um, an article on what we really need to encrypt according to GDPR and other style and other um, privacy regulations like HIPAA and FDA. And I will share the links to the full text of GDPR and to the, um, and to the better, um, better formatted version of GDPR. So you ask about something more practical than the actual regulation. Hmm. Uh, the, actually, the regulation is really practical. As I said, I read it, I read it in full and it's very eye-opening. I will actually recommend that you at least live through the you know, some you know summary of GDPR of uh, British uh, Privacy Act and of CCPA, and this will put things into a pers perspective, and you'll be able to deal with um, this privacy issues with more efficiency. Yeah. Okay, I guess that answers the question. Um, I, okay, thank you very much for being with us today. We're actually super in time. Thank you for having me. Yeah.